right? People get so quiet so fast. It's, it's very unlike a Google audience where people just keep talking anyways. It's great. Uh, our next speakers uh, are Steve Lauren and, uh, who, what's your last name? Yeah. Yiharro. <laughs> they are here from, <laughs> they're here from HP Labs in Bristol. And uh, they're going to be talking about a system they put together called Smart Frog. Uh, Julio is a senior researcher at HP Labs. He's uh, one of the Smart Frog architects and has led the transition to open source. His research interests include configuration, management, testing, and security of distributed systems. Steve is a researcher at HP Labs exploring the challenges of large scale system deployment. He is an Apache member and a committer on something. <laughs> what? <laughs> on Ant. Oh. <laughs> He's a co-author of the award-winning book Java Development with Ant, and has just committed the second edition to the repository. This will ship just in time for Christmas, so gift wrap it for everyone. Uh, in his spare time, he's overthrowing the classic soap stacks of Java and uh, writing a lightweight alternative alpine. So, Steve and Julio. Julia's meeting the second half of the talk. So, Alan's introduced us. We work in HP Labs on research and we work on deploying large scale systems. And when you deploy large scale systems, there's a problem of getting them working. And that's why we've drifted into testing. It wasn't our main focus, but it's something we have to do to get things working. So, to start off with, what, what, uh, we're going to test distributed systems. So, what is a distributed system? Here's two. On the left, CERN's Large Hadron Collider. On the right, a classic 3D web application. Hands up anyone who has a problem with bringing up the big thing on the left. Anyone in the audience wants to get that working? Oh, one person. Okay. Um, you better get it right, because if he gets it wrong, Geneva's going to cease to exist in a large collection of time. Um, the web application, well, we all have to do with those. How do you get these things working? Well, CERN know that if they get things horribly wrong, there are big holes in Geneva. So they actually put a lot of effort into it. They steal all the computing resources of the, of the continent. They put in a lot of effort into making sure everything's right. People spend their entire PhD just generating test data to test the applications before the thing goes live. It is a really big project. Whereas if you're just doing a little three-tier web application, you think, oh, that doesn't matter. Maybe we'll do some testing if we have time before we go live. And do we have any spare machines? Yes, there's an old laptop in the corner whose battery's gone, we'll host it. Hands up whose mach test machines look like the things on the right. Oh, yeah. One there. Okay, two there. This is part of my home data center, by the way. <laughs> we'll be testing against it later on. So, it's just like those little three tier applications, web applications, people just don't take them seriously. They build them and they, they click on the browser, hit reload a couple of times, and they ship it. And really, that has to change, because it is a distributed system, and it doesn't work first time. <coughs> so, in the classic unit testing world, they say, any feature without the test doesn't exist. We're going to extend that to system to say, any application without adequate system test doesn't exist. It is up to you and your management to define what adequate is. So the key point is, no system test, no application. Hands up who shipped an application without any system test. Ooh. So, uh, how do we actually make system testing properly work? Probably the biggest challenge is getting those people to put their hands up, put their hands up saying, we haven't done tests. All of you, pretty much, to, sit, to go home and write tests. It's about education, it's about motivation. And it's a really hard problem. I think it's one of the things we can discuss in the next couple of days is how to get people writing good hard tests. I don't know how to solve it. What I can say is if we make it easier for people to actually write tests, if we provide really compelling value from writing those tests, if you write a system test and the results go, wow, isn't that good, we've got results, then maybe people will actually go ahead and write those tests. So, Julio and I, we've been worrying about the other parts of the problem. Writing the tests, running the tests, and analyzing the results. And the first thing is writing those tests. 
And here we are not going to announce a text framework. We don't have a successor to JUnit. We have nothing like that. And the reason for that is we don't think there is a single unified test framework for system testing. There's so many different machines you're trying to deploy, and there's a front end, there's a back end, there's all that stuff. And you cannot say, yes, here is a test framework for testing systems. At a quick glance, here are some of the things that you can do to test Java side stuff. You've got your basic JUnit 3 and JUnit 4. You've got extensions to those JUnit, especially Apache Cactus. You've got HTTP units, test HTTP pages. And then, if you're doing AJAX stuff on the client side, you've got JS unit scripting JavaScript. You've got Selenium, which we'll be hearing about later. And all these things, they, they become essential parts of a testing system. And they all need to run together. To say your system is ready, you've got to run the unit tests, the Cactus tests, the Selenium tests, and all this stuff. And then when things go wrong, you want to find out why they failed. So we're saying, it's not our problem to say which test framework you want to use. What we're trying to do is coordinate all those and run them together. So it's running the test is the area that we've been focusing our work on. Now today, system testing is kind of an afterthought. Unit testing is just something that's slowly coming together. People understand about JUnit and running your unit tests. And all the development tools, they've come to They've come to terms with that thing. That's the area they focus on, is enabling unit testing. You have your IDE, you have ANT. You have you know, simple tools where you can type away on the command line and say ANT test. You run the test, you get the result. Everything builds on JUnit or TestNG. And if you have any system testing stuff, it runs behind JUnit to say, look, oh, your simple unit test runner, we can also do system tests. But it's an afterthought. And it's an inadequate afterthought because the machines people are testing are not realistic. You're still testing on your local machine. You're still testing with your local network. You aren't going to run tests where you deploy to your server that's beyond the firewall over a slow network connection. And but if you did, then you discover that, in fact, your little soap client is too chatty and it expects the firewall not to be there. People don't do that. They write their test, think it works, and they ship it. And then people phone up saying, oh, it doesn't work. I'm behind the firewall. So that's why you need realistic system tests. Like I said before, adequate system tests. So we need to stop thinking about system tests as an afterthought. This is our vision of the future. Of the future. Okay, this is what's going to happen. And the key thing is, is that you stop saying, I'm going to run my tests on my local machine. Instead, you say, we have a farm of machines. I'm going to run my tests over them. You're going to talk to some kind of server. It's going to allocate the machines you want, with the operating systems you want, the configurations you want. It's going to build them up on demand, <coughs> present them to your test runner that's then going to deploy your application onto some of them, your tests on the other. It's even going to have the network that you want in there as well. You say, right, I want the proxy server that's unreliable and returns the wrong responses. You can get that. And so it's the host and the network are part of the things you have to simulate. Then when you run those tests, things aren't going to work. So you want to find out why they didn't work. And that means you want the output from both ends of the system. You even want the output from that unreliable proxy server as well. So you're going to collect all that data, and then you have this problem, which is you have a vast amount of data from that test run. And you're trying to think of why it doesn't work on some machines, why it works on others. So you need to have a different way of presenting all those results. And finally, it's too much hassle to type into the command line. We want these tests running all the time. So the tests are just, just running away all the time. As soon as you make a change to your web application, everything redeploys, the tests run against a real deployed system. And then if the test fails, you get to know. So instead of having this kind of life cycle, normally people do something where they say code, well, they do code and ship, the waterfall model. They say code, test, code, test, code, test, ship. But we actually think about deployment in the process. So that becomes code, deploy, test code deploy test in a circle. And finally, once you're ready, you go straight from test to ship. So you, you, you adapt how you work to take into account deployment and system testing. So that's the future. And that, that is still a research project, I'm going to be honest. There is nothing that can do that today. The good news is, Julio and I, we work in a research lab. So we are allowed to do research, you think. And the primary thing that we actually research is large-scale system deployment. 
how to write a complicated application and deploy it across five machines, 500 machines, four different sites. The challenge of actually bringing up big complicated applications. Now, we kind of, we're starting to work on that. The smart prop tool we work on can deploy large scale systems. But then you have the problem which follows on from that, which is how do you test that you've deployed them successfully? How do we test that SmartFrog itself works? And this has actually caused us to do <coughs> this testing. For people who are curious, this is actually an entire open source product. You can go and download it from the website and get in you. So you can actually play with this when you go home. I'll point out it is a research project. It's not production, it's research, but we use it in production inside HP. So how does it work? One of the most key things, our belief, is that the problem with deploying a distributed system is not the simple problem of getting your application up there. People always think deployment, oh, that means copying the binary to a remote system. That is not deployment. Deployment is getting the stuff you've just written to work. It's a challenge of actually configuring the different bits of a big system so that they're actually coherent, so that the database comes up on one machine, the application server comes up on the other, and the application server talks to the database with the right username and password. It's a matter of configuring DNS so that they will walk to each other. And it's a problem of actually choreographing that deployment so that the DNS server comes up before the database server, before the application server. And the way we deal with it is this SmartFrog language that is not XML. And there's a reason for that. And it is a language that is designed to describe complicated systems through inheritance. So I'm going to design a system here, an inheritance and aggregation, let's be precise. So I have a distributed system. The first thing I have down here is my logging server, so logging extends log. I'm going to log at level 3 to a directory here. That's one machine. The next thing I've is in my database, and it's extending a MySQL component. It's something knows how to install and configure MySQL. But I'm going to say, I want to log over there, and here are some users I want to create. And I can also add the actual database tables there, even some pre-population database. On the other machine over here, I have the application server that is now bound to the database, and it gets a kind of a runtime reference for that. It gets parameters it can copy over. So they're sharing information when they get brought up. And then finally, up top, we say the system consists of the application server and the database and the logging. So you build a big system by taking smaller things and merging them together. But then, when these things get deployed, we have a set of nodes. We have a little daemon running on each machine that can deploy the entire thing down and talk amongst the different machines to actually bring the system up. So you can talk to one machine and say, right, deploy everything, and it will bring up the different bits in order. So that is SmartFrog. It is a language for deploying and large-scale systems where the challenge of deployment is configuration and choreography. I'm not going to talk about language today. It would take too long, but we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll go into it as we go through some of the demos. The key point is, as far as smart folks are concerned, a test is just something else to deploy. If you can deploy an application server and a database on one machine, it's even easier to deploy a copy of JN on a different machine. If that machine is local, it could be 500 miles away. It's just something else to deploy. So that's what we do. And that, that changes how you think about testing. Instead of saying, I'm going to run my application in the IDE, you start saying, I'm going to deploy my tests and just leave them running. It says, a test run consists of deploying the application server and the database. It may even consist of bringing up virtual images of you know, copies of Vista and Windows, X, Windows 98 on a machine to say, I want to test on those machines too. And that's all the kind of things you want to do for testing. You want to collect the results, and then finally, at the end of it, you want to undeploy it, where you say, I want to roll back, and everything you've created just goes away. So that, that's what we're trying to do. Now, like I said before, it's research, and this is something, we're not really a project that works on testing. We're a project that works on deployment. It's just testing is something we do as part of our process and it's we got more and more involved in. So it's still something we're evolving for our own needs, but we think our needs are quite, they're quite advanced. If other people are working on the same kind of deployment problems, we have similar needs. So what we don't do is have a test. We don't have a new test framework. We think Jane is good. We think TestMG is good. What we instead have is a, a test runner, a way of running arbitrary tests. So, 
smart frog, it deploys components on different machines. And we have a set of components that can deploy tests and collect results. There's something here called a test runner that can run test suites. Right now we have test suites for JNIT 3.8 that's working. We have JNIT 4 and test NGs that don't exist yet because they're not passing a test, they don't exist. But the idea is we can run arbitrary test suites in different languages and we just want to collect the results and correlate them. It doesn't matter to the test runner which language, which framework you're using to run the tests. The main thing is it generates reports in a format we can understand. So you can run your tests on whatever machine you deploy to. The results of that can be relayed over the network to anything that's listening to tests. And we have outputs, we have basically three main listeners there, standard console output, statistics, and XML. And underneath that we have an XHTML listener, just extends XML and generate XHTML results. So while you're running your tests, your listeners are collecting the results, they're collecting statistics, and they're they can generate XML and XHTML reports on a different machine from where you're running the tests. I could be running the tests on five different machines, but I'll have one single server collecting the results, trying to correlate between them and produce reports that aggregate the results of all the different machines. A test suite itself is just something we describe in the SmartFrog language. This is a simple one for an HTTP unit test. It says, HTTP unit test extends J unit test suite. It's saying, right, I'm a J unit test suite. I'm running the package D1 web app test, so it's running everything in classes in that package. And then down here, I have a list of classes, event D, happy tag, and index test. The main reason I have to list all the tests is just because Java itself doesn't provide me a way to say, give me a list of all tests, of all classes in a particular package. But actually, it's nice because it lets, me, it lets me comment out tests that aren't working in the of problems. But then, what we do here is we say, I'm going to deploy this on a machine called Client. This is a magic keyword here, SF Process Host Client, that says, when I deploy this component, I'm going to deploy it on a machine called Client. So that's all. We're just adding one attribute. We can actually deploy this on a different machine. So I'm going to run these tests on a client machine. I need to pass in a server URL that says TBD, TBD to be defined. So that URL, we don't know it yet when we define this template, but we say, before you can deploy this, you have to fill in the URL to the server. And then we're going to pass that down to the JNIT tests as a normal Java system property. So we'll be running these tests in a new process on a new machine and setting properties for it. The JNIT tests themselves, they look like normal JNIT tests. They don't know they're being deployed into the smart frog. All they know is they're running somewhere, and there's a system property pointing them at the server. So that is pretty much all it takes to take an existing JNIT test and deploy it in the smart problem. However, it's not enough just to say, well, we can distribute your application. We're going to think about, you know, what, what does that mean for a methodology for testing? How are you going to work with it? And this is, this is the process we think, we think seems to work. You need to allocate bigger test systems. That could be done on demand, it could be done in advance. You can deploy the application across your nodes. You can deploy your tests on different nodes, finally you're going to collect the results, and then you're going to post process it. So let's try and do that, shall we? First of all, we'll look at different kind of deployment scenarios. And there's about four different scenarios we come, we've come to encounter so far, where you have an application versus test. So traditional testing says, I'm going to deploy the application on a single node, I'm going to deploy the test on a single node, standalone. Another problem is we do deploy a test in a single node, but we need to deploy the application on multiple nodes. And that's, that's kind of client server. We'd be saying, I'm going to test my client against four different servers, see how they behave, and see how they differ. Finally, you say, the uh, next problem is we actually run tests on multiple nodes. And the first one though says, I have a test, and I want to run it on 20 different machines. I want to run it on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, variations of all of them. There, you're basically, you're in the classic world of Java, because how Java is right one tends to test everywhere, and there's nothing wrong with that. The main thing is, it's been really hard to test everywhere. If you can automate your testing, you can say, yeah, we really can test everywhere. You say, we really have tested in all these machines. And finally, you have this cutting edge problem. We have a fully distributed application and tests. So your application runs a multiple node, your tests run a multiple node, and somehow you're trying to get them working. That is, that is pretty advanced. I would, I would currently still advise people to stay clear of that right now. It's a, 
it is complicated. Start with client server or testing multiple nodes. Once you've got the hang of that, move to the big one. So let's go into our first little demo. I'm going to try and show working code here. What I'm not doing is bring up VMware images, so we're going to all deploy in the same machine for now. But here is a simple, simple, uh, simple three-tier system. Web application, database, web page at the front. So we're going to bring up database, we're going to bring up application server, we're going to bring up JBoss. And how are we going to test that? Well, we're going to have two different kinds of tests running. We're going to use HTTP units. Does anybody know what HTTP unit is? Hands up. Oh, that's really good. For those who don't know, HTTP unit is a set of Java classes for testing static HTML pages. You can basically say, fetch me a page, and then you can navigate around it and say, I want the link with ID link one. Follow that. If you get an error message, it fails the test. So you can, you can walk around a nice set of static web pages very easily. The other thing we're going to run is Apache Cactus tests. Hands up who knows what Apache Cactus is. OK, there are about eight hands in the audience. Apache Cactus is wonderful for anybody writing server-side stuff in Java. When you go home, go look up Apache Cactus. What it actually does is it lets you run JUnit tests inside the application server. So when I run a Cactus test here, what it's doing is talking over a server at the application server saying, run a test with this name, and the results are being fed back in. Now, Classic HTTP, classic cat, there's a bit of a problem here, is it's a real pain to set up a class path on the client machine or the, the server machine. And it's really fiddly. We, we have plans to fix that. But right now, we're just running cactus unchanged under our test plan. So without further ado, let's, let's do a demo. Now, first thing is, I'm running a copy of SmartCog Daemon on this machine. Right now, it has a root process that has brought up a window. Nothing exciting. We're about to deploy a web application to it. And fast deploy. If I didn't if I type deploy rather than fast deploy, it would actually rebuild the entire application and stick it out there in one go. So this is going to talk to the application server. We have now deployed our application. We have just deployed a database and JBoss. And have a look and see what's happening. Now it says yes, there's a diary here, and the diary consists of a database with some various attributes. Drivers, part of the deployment says, when I deploy to JBoss, I have to remember to copy the MySQL JDDC jar of jar file of the application server. And that's kind of the fix up of the application server you get before it goes running. Then I have the web application itself. Now I'm just deploying an AIR file, a classic Java enterprise application file. So that is our application deployed, and we will. We, all, we can show that working by hand, that's not hard. There, application, not very much. We have a, a web page here. It's generating an RSS feed. It has a happy page that says, run some tests. If I <coughs> click on this page, you get an error because, in fact, JBoss on Windows behaves differently from JBoss on Linux. And EJB doesn't work consistently on both. So, this system is not correctly deployed, it's going to be failing. And well, we should find that out when we run our tests. So let's, let's run the test and see. And, oh, there's the test command for. We're running this from inside out, so let's do a test deploy. Huh? Test deploy. So now we are deploying under SmartFrog the test on the same machine. And now we are running our tests. What to say? It's just, just gone. There's no results. Let's 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 find out what happened. What's happening is that when we run this application, we are creating test results as we go along. We're actually creating HTML pages. Here's the HTTP unit tests, and they're saying, "Oh, here's a summary. Some tests worked. There were errors. I've got 50% success rate." If you scroll along, some are green and happy, some are not happy. I'm getting a server from an error from the server, and we're getting a stack trace. Things aren't working. That, that is life for a system. Now, what have we actually deployed then? Let's actually go and look in the code and say, what have we deployed? Oh, 
I'm deploying a component here, something called an inner test run, that says I'm going to run on a machine called Demo, and if it finished, when I, at the end of the run, I'll finish. I could also deploy the repeating test run, which actually sleeps for three seconds and runs the test indefinitely. So I can keep running a test forever, which is actually kind of nice during kind of evolutionary development. You just have the test running all the time. Every time you point that web page, you hit reload, and your results get updated immediately. So there's, there's no notion of having to actually remember to run the test. They're running all the time. So we've actually extended an existing test suite, which is this one here that basically says we're going to run tests and we're going to listen to HTML results and we're going to take to make GDP unit tests that thing we said before we're going to bind it to the URL so this is where the dynamic binding comes in if I deploy a different machine I have to feed in that URL to the other systems and we all get connected together and work so we're deploying the application server and the test side by side there's nothing to stop us deploying those tests on a different machine and collecting results which lets us test that the network in, in the, is working too. It lets us test that the, that the firewall isn't getting in the way. And it just, it lets you, you know, scale things up. Where it becomes interesting is if you start running something like Selenium, where you can actually say, I'm going to, I want to test on three different web browsers and collect those results too. So I want to know that my application works properly under Safari, under Firefox, under IE, under IE7. We can run those tests and we collect the results in. If everything's working, we get a nice green bar. And if something isn't working, maybe a red bar. You're in an orange bar to say, work on some and it fails on others. But then you're in, a, you're in the problem of analyzing the data. But the first step is we can run tests across multiple machines simultaneously in the background while you're busy developing your application. So that is, that is the first problem, the simple problem of testing a three-tier application server. The next interesting problem that we've been trying to test is the, the single client against multiple endpoints. As Alan said in the introduction, I've been writing my own SOAP stack. And the reason for that is because I think the official sum SOAP stack and the conceptual model of SOAP as remote procedure calls is in fact fundamentally misguided. I also have to use this SOAP stack as part of the implementation, the HP implementation of a SOAP API for deployment, which we're standardizing as part of the Global Grid Foundation, or well, Open Grid Foundation, as called this week. Open Grid Forum. Anyway, so we have a SOAP stack and an application on top of it that we have to be able to tick off before the thing becomes a standard saying, this thing works. And how are we going to test that? Well. If there was, in an ideal world, there would be a nice standard set of tests for things like WS addressing, which would all be able to run against and say, yes, we have a SOAP stack that works. But there isn't that. So instead, what we do is we run our test against different machines. We have a Brazilian implementation, we have NEC implementation, and we have a little HP endpoint that actually runs at that data center I showed in the beginning of the slide on my laptop in my living room. And we actually, we're going to run our client against all those things simultaneously. Now, you can actually do this on the run. You can write a pretty complicated build file that can run these same tests. But there is two, there are some big differences when we actually treat these as something to deploy. The first one is we can run each test client in parallel. So we're going to test against the HP implementation, against the NEC implementation, against the Brazilian implementation simultaneously, three separate processes with those results streaming into the website as we go along. And that's important because, particularly the one in Brazil, it's a long way away. It's pretty slow. It takes a couple of seconds for each operation to come through. If you've got a, every single test case is making a lot of operations, your test can take a while to run. So we're going to run the test, we're going to collect the results, and we're going to stream those results to the website as we go along. The other fun thing we can do, which I'm not going to demonstrate today, is that this HP endpoint, it's running on top of the smart clock. And provided the ports in this firewall are open enough, I can actually redeploy from my machine here, or my machine at work, I can redeploy the HP implementation, even though the application is beyond the firewall. Which means that I can do a coordinated test of, I'm not going to test on my local machine, or do a deploy and test on the local machine, I'm going to do a deploy right beyond the firewall, 
and run a test. And that's nice, because if it works for me, beyond the firewall, I can be pretty much sure that it's going to work for other people too. One of the big problems I have with testing these other endpoints is I say, they say my endpoint's live. And I say, well, I can't see it. And they go, oh, it's a firewall. I keep on forgetting. Because too often people say, it works for my machine, so it works for the outsiders. You need to factor the firewall in. So let's go to that one. Now, let's see what applications are running right now. Okay, so we're still running our diary application on port 8080. Let's bring up our own copy of the application server. Bring our hands again. Big pause, but don't bring it. The more complicated the deployment script, the longer it takes to deploy using it. Here we go, the deploying application. There we are. So this is Jetty, we're running a copy of JBoss and Jetty now as reports. So this is our SOAP stack. Local host. Yep, we're running. I can check that, I can go Alpine. You can join in, if I give you IP address, you can point your browser at this, by the way. Oh, there we go. There it says this is a soap endpoint. I don't know if wizard on the fire or anything wrong with that. So let's let's run those tests against local local host. And and test. And we're on a test target of local host. That has been a deployed test against local host. So that's me saying, yeah, it seems to work locally. We're getting some errors now. That's because they're running. Um, that was running JU and that was not deploying JU. So now we're going to deploy the unit test. Well, the pause, right, so we're now running the unit test. <coughs> I'll actually do a quick clean up of this directory to show this is not a good demo. If you go into localhost directory, we're saving results under here under the host name and the process name. So localhost and the machine called Zermatt then says, right, we're testing the SOAP portal and look at that, everything works. Everything's a nice green color. That's what we want, isn't it? Nice and green. So I can say my implementation works against <coughs> my machine, no real network in between. And that, that's, that's a fake test because it's SOAP. It's designed to work over the network. So let's run against HP. That is now going to run against the laptop on my house. Okay, there's that one running. Now, let's run it against NEC. So we're starting up these tests in parallel, they're being deployed. We're not running them, they're just going to go off in the own process and run the tests. Now, our grid. Our grid is a Brazilian grid. We're doing some really interesting stuff, it's all based on Java. You can donate CPU cycles to it and they're providing this so we can deploy stuff to their grid. So now I'm deploying, if I return to that picture, what I've just done then is I've just deployed four copies of the unit tests in different processes. One against local host, one against HP, one against NEC, and one against the Brazilians. So how do we know that? Let's go and check the results, shall we? We've got a set of directories. Let's go into the HP one. And there we go. I'm still passing all my tests. My implementation interoperates. My client interoperates with my server, even over a long haul network. What about the Brazilians? Let's check that out. Well, right now we have an HTML file of size of zero bytes. That means that test is still running. As we go along, every time another test passes, we should be flushing out some files there, coming empty pages right now. But the program actually, the test cases get streamed out to files. <coughs> if you look at how normal test things work under, say, AMD, AMD runs all the tests, 
creates XML files. Once it's finally finished, does an XSL transformation, generates a result. The effect is if you've got a long test that takes 20 minutes to run, you might as well go and have a coffee. Because your test, you're not even going to begin to see any test results until the complete test is over. What we're doing here, trying to do here, is generate XML, HTML pages on the fly. And you can see how it's going on. So now we've basically got different processes running. We have the test HP process running its listener and tests and the, the algorithm stuff. They're all running away. And they're slowly collecting the test results as they come in. It's not running very well. Anyway, the point is we are trying to stream our test results as we go along. We're certainly straining every single test suite when it finishes the same results. It looks like it's not flushing properly on individual test cases. And we're streaming this file out as we go along. And the reason for that is that we can generate test results on the fly. So you don't have to wait for the entire, entire set of tests to finish before you can see the results. What we're actually doing, if you're curious, is we're creating an XHTML, X HTML page where we actually paste in our style sheet. So you can then post a single HTML page around. And it's just saving out all the things in different classes. So it is both an HTML page for end users but it's also an XML file that you can actually post-process later on. And that means that we can actually, you don't need to generate a, a classic XML page, you can just generate XHTML, and you can feed it into other applications for data analysis. So, we're running those tests, we'll leave them going. They'll eventually come up with results. So, that's distributed testing of a remote endpoint. And it's nice because it means my client, I get to test how well it handles delayed networks, how well it handles unreliable networks. We actually had this running over on a continu continuous integration server, so it was running every, every hour. It was rerunning all our tests against our endpoints until one of the other endpoints phoned up and told us to stop it because it was just putting too much load on their system. The way they designed the system is when they deployed, it's creating new processes, and we're effectively bringing their system to its knees. The other interesting thing to point out is that because there are no standards for things like WS addressing, our SOAP stacks don't talk together properly. We're going to have errors in there. And a lot of those are actually errors in the underlying interpretation of things like WS resource framework and WS addressing and other standards beginning with the words WS. And we get this fantastic process of blame assignment. If it's just your program against your machine, your problem. But if it's your program, their machine, somebody is at fault, and you don't want to go to any effort to change your code. So one of the things we actually do is on my remote machine, this is my remote machine, and it is generating logs on the fly every test run. So whenever somebody runs a test against me, I'm actually creating a log of what went wrong, and I'm saving it in a public place so people can see the stack traces on my machine when they fail. And this is actually, there's nothing special in I'm just using log, Apache Log4j can be made to save an HTML page, in a kind of rolling HTML page, and I'm just publishing that somewhere. And the reason for that is, when the tests fail, as they will, the other person can look at my side of the soap stack and try and find out what went wrong. I even save the payloads of messages that come in. So there is a if I can zoom this in a bit more. Here is an XML message just from received, so message, XML, whatever. And that's really nice because when that test fails, I have now have the exact message somebody sent me from a remote machine that I can use to fix my code. What would be nice, what would be nice, and we don't have that yet, be nice, if I could actually get that test this this log data into my application test run, so that when I run my application here, I'm collecting all the log data that gets run on the client side here, but I would like to get the log output from my remote endpoint. I'd like to pull it back and integrate it with that log, so I get the stack traces and the logs of two machines intermingled to really find out what happened. Because right now I get two logs and I have to stare at them side by side and say, okay, that, 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 that. 
and just kind of correlate them by hand. And now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Julia, who will do the rest of the talk, and he will talk about how we actually test smart frog itself. Hello, everyone. So, the reason why we started uh, interested in testing and why it's uh, an interest of us, even if it's a kind of side activity in our research, it was a smart frog. So, smart frog is, uh, as Steve has been describing, it is a distributed system. So, when we started testing the smart frog to verify that it worked in every possible situation, and we started, especially when we started taking it into production, we went through all these different scenarios for testing the smart frog. So we went from the traditional testing of using the uni to test all the different classes in the code. Then we started testing parts of the, the daemon or parts of the, the applications that we were deploying. Then we started as well running a smart frog in different platforms because we basically run a smart frog uh, back in our, uh, in our site. We test a smart frog with uh, four different platforms. We test uh, with Linux, we test with Windows, we test uh, because we are HP, we test with HPUX, and also we test with macOS. So we had to write to, re uh, to run all the tests in all the different systems. But a smart frog is a distributed system, so that wasn't enough to, to test the, to verify that it worked. Many times we went into production, and when we were deploying a real distributed application, something was failing in the system. To test the distributed system, one of the things that we had to do was to develop an application that we could test as well. So the arithmetic application here that is being deployed as part of the test is uh, an application that will have a deterministic uh, output. So it is a very simple application. It's a calculator. So each component runs a different operation, a different arithmetic uh, operation. So in that uh, respect, what we can do is to generate a complex calculation then create a template uh, using the language that describes that operation and then distribute the different nodes, uh, the different operations in different nodes, and then collect the results. And because we know the output of the, the, the operation, we can verify that the application is working. The application in itself is uh, generated automatically, so we can decide if we want to test this application in three nodes or five nodes or 500 nodes. And then the system will take care of it uh, if you have the resources for deploying it. Then, uh, once we have the application that we wanted to test, we tried to look around to see if there was anything that we could use to test uh, this application, to basically to test the smart frog and see. And we couldn't find anything. So the, the thing that we thought about, uh, well, that's what we do. We do deployment of large scale systems. So let's use smart frog to deploy it. So in the diagram, what you can see is that uh, basically we use an stable version of smart frog which is deployed in every, in every node. And then when we deploy a test, what we are doing is really starting a new network of uh, nodes using different JVMs. So these, these nodes will deploy a new JVM, and those new nodes will use the, the latest code from CVS using whatever version you, you want to test. And then it will deploy the application as well on top of it. And uh, the last thing that this test runs is uh, basically goes to the same application running it through different scenarios. So basically, uh, you can deploy smart frog without no security. We don't recommend that unless you are running your own system and you are in a closed network. We run the, the system without uh, dynamic class loading, where all the Java classes and everything can be downloaded remotely when the demons need it. And then we run through the same system, the same operation, in four different combinations to cover all these different possibilities. So with, without security, and the combination of everything. And we verify that everything, all the different results are coherent. One thing that we don't do yet is uh, when we run, we run in a fixed setup uh, in a fixed number of resources at the moment. So we have Windows machines, Linux machines, and HP UI machines. And we have different, um, different versions of the same application that will run across these different machines in, uh, in different ways. But uh, where we are going is uh, to be able to deploy this in, uh, in a changing environment. So, so you can prescribe, as part of your test, you would describe, basically, what is the setup that you want in each machine, which kind of networking you want. So you could uh, create virtual machines using fake, uh, switches in between, or fixed routers to introduce problems, and to run through all those different scenarios automatically. And also to allocate these machines with different versions of Linux, with different versions of, uh, of Windows, with different versions of HPUX, verify that it runs in all the different setups. And everything using uh, non-fixed uh, 
resources. So this test is probably the most advanced things that we run at the moment in terms of testing. Uh, it is very good. Uh, it is very good at highlighting basically verifying that your application works. It's fantastic. It will tell you basically if something breaks. It will tell you if you have a problem in the network. You have big delays. You have something misconfiguring the network, for example, DNS, uh, which could, uh, by the way, smart reduces uses RMI internally. So one of the problems, for example, if your network is not properly configured, basically, uh, it will screw completely. The Java, the JVM, basically will go in big poses and, and the whole system uh, won't work properly. So this application is really good at highlighting sometimes, you know, customers a scenario because you go to their network and it doesn't work. And basically, it will give you a good uh, overview of, of everything that is working. The problem is, it is good as well at generating lots of data because it's going to be collecting data about the application, it's going to be collecting data about the different demons, it's going to be collecting data about the, the different environments in which it's running. What it is not good at is, once it breaks, is how do you find what it broke? Basically, there are so many variables in this setup that can go wrong, that is very difficult. You have lots of data, and that's probably where Google will have about data mining this data. So this goes uh, to the last thing uh, that we wanted to talk about this, basically. And the eight units is generating good reports. Everything, everyone is generating logs, and uh, everyone is generating, knows how to generate data, but the problem is, how do you quickly identify what is the problem in your application? People working in these duty systems probably know what I'm talking about. Is it the firewall? Is it the non-local networking? Is the local machine? Is your application? Is your code? Because especially when you have something like a smartphone that is open source. The first thing that people say is, I've tried your example X. It doesn't run. You have a problem. You have a bug. Yeah. Let's, let's go back and see where <coughs> you're running this. Do you have DNS working in your machine? Is it working properly? Can you ping the two machines that you want to connect to? You know, and many, many, many times is uh, is something happening in the system, in the configuration. So, to support that claim, basically that we need to improve this, uh, and uh, HTML report is probably one of the most used uh, reporting tools at the moment for for unit testing or for system testing. And this was uh, really good five years ago. This give you information about your different packages, structures, everything in packages. It basically, you don't have that many packages. It's something that you can browse through. You can find information. But the moment you have two machines, it doesn't give you information about what's happening with those machines. Yeah, it will collect some part, some information about the environment, but that's not usually enough. So the reason for this is the underlying XML that Anne is using. So the only thing that uh, in this report give us information about the host name is this little attribute there. And it was introduced by Steve a few years ago when we discovered that uh, you know running two different tests and trying to merge them was a problem because they didn't say where it was running. So how do we know which machine was causing the problem? Was the Mac OS? Was the, the Windows? Was the, the Linux? Was a different version of Linux? The other thing with this is that also it gives you very little information about the context in which this, uh, this uh, test is running. The only thing that it does is to go through the JVM and extract the system properties. And it has an, an additional problem. This particular test report, it basically generates, uh, an statistics, generates a statistics about what happened when you were running your test. To do this, what it does is to hold in memory a big DOM document with all the tests that you are running and all the test results. So if your gate unit process fails halfway through and it crashes, you have lost everything. So and that's a big problem. So one of the, the things that we would like to discuss and open a discussion in is that basically, as Steve pointed before, we have different ways of testing applications. And we have different frameworks that are testing different parts of your system, but each of them is generating a different kind of reporting. And none of them usually have or are thinking about third-party applications collecting those data, that data. So we would like at least to start a discussion about uh, basically creating a particular uh, shared representation for the data that is coming from testing frameworks. So we could collect uh, this, this data. People could write applications for data mining this data and try to start thinking about you know, what are the kind of things that people need when, when a test fails, what kind of is the, the metadata that you need there. 
And also think about that it's not going to be running in only one node. It's going to need to run across different nodes, so you need to be able to collect that data. And also basically think potentially not only Java. When we are testing applications, we are testing many other applications. So the first approach is uh, that we have taken is uh, we have generated our own reporting, as Steve has been mentioning, with some some different things. But the main the main feature that we have here is that it is reporting live. Basically, everything, every test suite that is executed dumps the content to the network, basically, and the report will dump that to a web page. So you can see the progress of your on your test. You don't have to wait until the end. And if it crashes halfway through, at least you get everything that was there. You don't have to go to the local logs of the machine or, or try to find what happens. In our case, by the way, uh, our main research topic is distributed systems. Right? We, we work in utility computing. So uh, things that we do is allocate machines on demand. And those machines probably are not there by the time you want to check if the test was successful. So probably the machine was already rebooted and reallocated to someone else. So, so you need to be able to collect all that data as much as you can and then be able to, to do the post-processing after. One thing in the right direction that we've uh, been uh, collaborating with as well is this is someone's PhD. So he has been writing uh, something called Grid Unit. It is open source as well. It is uh, in SourceForge. And basically, this it is a string GUI. Uh, written in Java, but what it does, well, the it is the first step in the right direction because it's trying to aggregate all the data from different machines and trying to give you a way of navigating easily between uh, the different uh, sets of data that you collected and you can compare why a test was uh, failing in one machine, one, why it wasn't uh, working in the other machine, even if it was the same test and both of them were running Linux. But still, it's, it, it is a first step, it's nothing, it's nothing we did, but we would like you know, people uh, thinking about uh, this as well. So just to, to conclude the talk, basically, is, uh, what we wanted to describe here was uh, people have to think about system tests. People are getting good at writing tests for uh, applications. My background is, uh, I, well, my background, in my previous company, I was working for a telco. And there, they, people could afford long cycle development uh, developments. Uh, and Basically, they could have two teams, one developing the application, the other one uh, testing the application. We think that this is not acceptable anymore. So when you, when you are creating an application, the time to market is decreasing. So you are adding new features. You want to add new services. And you have to wait for the development team to produce the application and then the test team to test it for a week and then give you feedback about the bugs. And you know, you're not going to make it in, in time. So this has to be a continuous activity, and it has to be automated, which is the main theme of the, of the conference. So for when you think about system testing, basically think about uh, automated deployment. Once you have automated your application, how your application can be deployed in different configurations, adding automated system testing is something else. It's basically you add it into it. But if you have to deploy your application by hand, and then you want to do the automated, uh, automated uh, test, testing of it, it's going to take you far too long and it's not gonna it's not gonna work. Also if you are working in a small teams as well, it makes it impossible. And small companies cannot afford to have a dedicated team of testers. The other thing that we would like to get out of uh, this conference is uh, well opening the discussion about uh, creating an open format for all these test frameworks that are available. Uh, we know that there are some people here that uh, write some of these. So I start thinking about uh, you know what would be the right format to do it so that all people can contribute with tools to analyze the results. And if you are basically a test uh, framework author and you basically would like to talk uh, about this, come to see us. And we promise that we will integrate it with Ant and with the SmartFox and probably give it units. Also, if you are interested in SmartFox or testing with the SmartFox, please uh, visit the website. The website is smartfox.org. So. And one, one kind of a bit off topic. I don't know if anyone here works on standards. Is anyone working on standards in the, the conference? One person? Two? So, or well, three? So we've been working on standards for uh, for few few years because of the this GGF, the Global Grid Forum. And one thing that people tend to do is they develop uh, or they describe the standard on a piece of paper. And then after six months or once a year, basically, they get together and they, get, they do an integration fast. They find that nothing works. They walk away and they modify the standard again discovering things that probably you cannot even implement. So so why don't we change the way standards are being described? Why don't you describe a standard through test? Basically, these are the tests. 
And if you modify when the, the standard is being defined, you could demodify as well this test. And it will help you because developers will find things that don't make sense before they make it into the paper and the standard is approved. And then someone else will have to implement this and live with the, the problems. So if you're interested in that as well, this is basically just to be a bit uh, basically controversial. So if anyone has any questions, this is the, we have like five minutes. <laughs> Couple. <coughs> um, I want to bring up something that I didn't see explicitly mentioned in your presentation. One of the issues that if you're managing a testing process, if you're overseeing a testing process, is selecting the test to be scheduled mm -hmm. um, and you know, figuring out the sets and putting those together, maybe even automating the selection of them. You may have a base set that you want run on every build and then you want to go deeper on subsequent runs. And I didn't see that. And so it's kind of configuration of the testing, yeah. of the tests, and putting those together, and how do you do that and driving that? Well, I, I can give you my view in the, the ideal world. The ideal world would be a kind of portal where you send, well, in our case, we send a smartphone description to a portal, and the portal will schedule that. The, the way we do these configurations, they are templates. So as Steve said, you can comment parts of the description if you want, and you could decide which test. But also you could, on the fly, change attributes. So the portal, you could basically decide in your template which parts you want to tweak. And when you submit that test, you could say, OK, you know, this part of the test I want to run it is what I don't want. So, and the whole thing behind the scenes is, is done dynamically. And then that, that answers some of it, but then the, also you want to work with association of defects to particular tests um, so that you, for example, you say this is a regression test for defect 2000. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, that they're going in and touching this. I mean, just, you know, if you want to kind of be strategic in your testing, you have to be able to select the tests that are run based on what's being changed in the system, based on underlying knowledge. And so I think as much as the analysis side, and you talked about that being a difficult problem, mm -hmm. I think the scheduling and configuration side needs as much attention. Yeah, it, it does. And you know, there are some open source test case management systems, maybe looking at how you would configure work with those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Collecting test results uh, is, from a distributed system, is very similar to uh, well, network monitoring and management. And HP already have a very good tool for that, it's called OpenView. Did you look at integrating or extending OpenView to, to be a platform for this kind of thing? It's not open source. Okay. Um, you know, the, uh, well, think I just want it to work well. Yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned OpenView. OpenView is a good case for distributed testing. It would be a fantastic source of test data to feed into the logs. Okay. But I mean, it allows you to monitor and analyze what's going on in your network. Yeah, that would be one of the that that would be one of the sources for your data. So in this case, for example, we are not getting any any data, or in our smartphone test, we don't get data from the routers yeah. or the switches. But sometimes, you know, we have examples in which RAM will be casting. So we would like to know the configuration of the routers involved in that. That's where you could feed into, you could uh, get information from OpenView, which is good at collecting that, and then. Still, we have to probably how to aggregate this data and to make sense of it when you have it. Yeah, it's, but it's more, for example, OpenView is a good use case as well for testing because you know it covers so many systems and so many network systems on top. They have a good test problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've got one observation and a question. <clears throat> the observation is that if you're looking at an XML format for sending results back, then I think you should at least base it on atom feeds. Uh, yeah. Because atom entries can live outside of an atom feed and have data updated and so forth. So you could use that as a wrapper for whatever payload that you have underneath. Um, but the question is really how you deal with testing different versions of the same thing. I mean, it seems very uh, plausible with your test setup, you're testing different applications at the same time. But what about if you're, dip, if you're testing like the head version versus the stable version of the same thing, that maybe you've got collisions on various locked resources like ports or uh, files? And these are configuration problems. The yeah. way I see it, basically, you specify in that particular case, or I can talk about the smartphone or different. 
So you as you can specify, you can build what is the application that you're going to deploy. So you could have two different systems running two different versions of the same and try to do that. But the way I see it is, how do you describe this? You know, how do you describe the configuration of what you want to test? And then well, would you need two separate configuration files for making that happen? Because really, it's the same thing, and you've got to, you've got to configure it in the same way. It's just running different instances, almost yeah. like different code levels. Yeah, we, it's actually it, we're if you're using something like the Maven repository thing to actually switch versions of your artifact, all you do is change one property value to say I want version 10.01, and you can do everything else switches. So that's how we run. One thing about not running different versions is it's a good source of regression data. And that's part of data mining being enough to say, it's not enough to say it works. We mean like it's worked, and it takes three times as long, and the router is sending an alert saying you just flooded the network. You know, so there is some by running multiple versions, there's a lot of extra data you can generate and analyze. And we have done nothing of that, but I'd like to volunteer from the audience to do it for us. Nobody put their hands up. Um, I'm interested in uh, two things. I, I think, um, do, do you actually use SmartFrog or encourage people to use it for your production deployments? Because clearly, um, if you're going to test with that deployment, it'd be nice then to just be able to flip a switch and actually, you know, push out all your server infrastructure that way. And well, actually, you saw you use the GUI, but you also use a command line. You know, how developed are the GUI tools within that? Are they, you know, suitable to give to people from an operational point of view? And is that is that a focus? Is it something you're interested in doing? Or do you want to leave that to various tasks and those sort of people? So we are getting some more tools. We have very basic graphic tools for doing anything through a graphic GUI. So the language could allow you to do drag and drop and things like that, but we don't have any tools doing that. So usually a language is much more flexible than what you can represent on a GUI. That's not an excuse not to have a GUI for certain scenarios. But we don't have we have basic tools. Most of the tools are for managing the running system. So you can access the console that Steve was uh, using, that one access to the real system. It's all the data is representing the configuration data. is the real structure of your application. So you can navigate through it and you can even make changes. But we don't have anything further than that. So we have a plugin for Eclipse. Uh, but all these tools are basic. So we are becoming to add more and more tools. But we are not the GUI people, basically. We are interested in the in the research problems and the, the challenges of uh, you know writing and describing distributed systems. We have good ant tools. We have command line tools. We have a set of ants like here's the undeploy task and the deploy task. This is that I'm going to deploy something. And about to show a bit of inline smart frog inside my build file. So do you encourage people to do this in production? So like, yes. This is because, sorry, I, I'll start to repeat myself. Um, <laughs> But yeah, would you encourage people to use this for production deployment? And it's simply that when you deploy in production, you don't run the client tests. You're just, you know, you deploy your server, you deploy a MySQL server. Is yeah, that? You would I, you, I'm strongly in favor of automating production side deployment. It is interesting working with operations because they are, they are wonderful people who are deeply paranoid about the three o'clock in the morning phone call. I will also point out, if you work with operations, you get the phone call at 3.15 in the morning. You know, when it doesn't work, they go straight onto the developers afterwards. So, and actually, I think one of the things we, you need a deployment-centric process where you don't have a separate operations team. Yeah, you actually work with operations right from the beginning, and you're continually testing to some machines they manage. They're working with you right from the beginning, so you don't have a hard split between development and production. It's just all one system with one team working on it. And that yes, you want to automate production system deployment. So my final question would, you know, do you have a sort of vision of smart front team and running on? You know, as part of say a standard Linux distribution or whatever, so that you know developers can write this stuff and then hand it over to operations in the same way they might do as a damn package or something like that. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we just finished a project that we did uh, with uh, twelve animation companies in UK. We ran a kind of experiment. We had some interest as well about uh, we had collaborations in HP Labs with DreamWorks, so we had some some interest in rendering uh, applications, for example. So we did. Uh, uh, we just finished a, a project called C S E three D. So you can go to it's, it's, it's basically everything is public on that. Well, where two people were competing for resources, so they were accessing remotely to our utility. So all the backend servers, 500 machines in the backend, were managed uh, through the smart road. They run during nine months for 24 hours. So that can give you an idea of you know if it's production ready or not. 
and the machines were not in Bristol, so people were contacting with part of the service running in Bristol, the machines were allowed to remotely manage there because they have faster machines there than we do. I actually have two questions. First one, have you had the opportunity to try multi-development platform experiments where you have third-party tools from Microsoft, third-party components from Microsoft, Java clients, and just multiple platforms in that scenario? Um, we we work with Selenium, who use that, and that is that all runs browser side. We haven't done that much with Windows itself, or with all .NET based stuff. Okay. And then the second half. Um, you're talking about the difficulties in displaying the output and getting data out of all these things. Just for an inspiration source, you might want to consider looking at uh, Microsoft's new team build output uh -huh. the team foundation suite because they have a nice multi-test run output as part of their build report. Okay. Someone here has been waiting for a long time. I think I guess two microphones. One of the problems that you mentioned was data mining, and I'm actually curious if you'd considered using the scripts to do the data mining for you, because in many cases you've got dependencies in your scripts, such as a DNS server or something else, which seem like they could be addressed by subscripts. So basically, say this script has a dependency on A, B, and C, and have separate subunit tests to say, well, if this fails, go run these individual tests, and that way you're not doing the data mining yourself, you've got your own scripts to do it for you. Oh, yeah, you could have components, active components that react to changes in the system. Yeah. So when, you know, it could be an active test that behaves differently depending on what is happening on the net. But uh, still, you will collect the lots of data, and if it is only one case that fails, that's fine, but if you are collecting data from your switch, from uh, your network uh, provider, from you know, the other application, as Steve was pointing, somewhere in Brazil collecting the data of that application, still how do you present that in a way that is easy for the developer to know what's going wrong. So. But yeah, it's a good point. One of the hardest uh, aspects of building, testing, uh, designing distributed systems is what you do in the face of hardware failure. And I saw that you were you know, bringing up um, virtual hosts and running into those to run your tests. We love them. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? Uh, have you thought about how you might use those to deterministically produce hardware failures and then test the software reaction to that? Um, not through hardware failures, but what you can do is you can bring up some host, some Linux host, configured to act as routers, and you can simulate network failures that way, and unreliable proxies and that kind of stuff. But we haven't, we haven't simulated things like the PC that overheats. We haven't yeah. got anything like that, or the, the machine that's prone to race conditions. One of the interesting problems with dynamic allocation of machines is that not all machines are equal. No matter how much everyone says that your 500 machines are identical, there's one in the corner that either overheats faster and it's got a different clock and it's more prone to race conditions. So we have one machine, Eric's machine, that's just hideously unreliable. He's not allowed to touch it because it shows race conditions more than any other box and we just leave that alone. But that's actually something you want to remember when you do a test run is actually which machines you would allocate it. And when you rerun your test, you don't just want to say, oh, I want to rerun on the Windows box. You want to say, I want to rerun on the Windows box that failed before. But, and also just, it'd be nice to be able to bring up a virtual machine, run in it and say, when you hit this breakpoint, kill the virtual machine, because I'm going to test what this part of the system does, and suddenly this machine crashes. Well, those kind of things we can do, yeah. It's, it's limited to what you can simulate in terms of uh, hardware failure. Yeah. You can certainly simulate network partitions quite easily. Yeah, you wanted test framework authors to contribute to an XML interchange format. Mm -hmm. Do you have kind of like a version one that we could try and hit right now? Hey, we're not telling you what to do. We want to listen. Uh, which, which framework are you are you finishing, Richard? Uh, I've uh, got to a C green in C and simple test in PHP. Yeah, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what makes the best format. We still need to decide that, but then we ought to collaborate. If we come up with a good one, I promise we'll go with the smart frog and I can put it in Ants as well. And the test NG people are quite interested in one, so we can. We should work together on this. Not yet. Not yet. We have some, well, we have the ant one, we have our one, but they're, they're limited. They're just lessons that we should use in the real design. Yeah, the problem is that we have a limited view. That's why we are raising the question. You know. People uh, will have different needs, <coughs> not only our needs. No, it's actually after a limited version one that I could hit right now and figure out what the problem is. OK, well, you can look at what we've done and see what works and what doesn't. Okay. So we're going to have to cut the question short at this point because we're running out of time. 
But thanks very much, guys. And they're going to be around for discussion at lunch and through the rest of the conference.